This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. Jonathan Bennett and I talk this week with Sam Lambert of Planet Scale, which does MySQL and far more based on Vitesse. That is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 684, recorded Wednesday, June 8th, 2022, Planet Scale. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by New Relic. That next 9 p.m. call is just waiting to happen. Get New Relic before it does. And you can get access to the whole New Relic platform and 100 gigabytes of data free per month forever. No credit card required. Sign up at newrelic.com slash floss. And by Collide, that's Collide with a K. Get endpoint management that puts the user first. Visit collide.com slash floss. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash floss to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. Hello again, everybody, everywhere you are. I am Doc Searles, and this is Floss Weekly, where I'm joined this week by Jonathan Bennett himself. There hey, he is <clears throat> in his in his hideout in Oklahoma someplace. Yes, it's kind of a <laughs> stormy hideout today. I got woken up first thing this morning with my wife saying, it's really dark outside. And kaboom! So I may get interrupted by thunder, but that's all right. <laughs> hey, well, you you also live in a part of the country where where things get sucked into oblivion by by, by tornadoes, right? I mean, I mean they they call it Tornado Alley for a reason. Yes, yeah, yeah. Thing. <laughs> and you have earthquakes there now too. <laughs> uh, very very minor earthquakes. Uh, the 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 yeah. meme about that is uh, it's it's two lawn chairs with one of them fallen over. And we will rebuild. It's about how serious it was. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 how are you doing? I'm I'm good. Uh, you know, it's been kind of a, 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 a scramble for the show today because at first we thought we didn't have a guest and then, oh, no, we have a guest. And then Simon had something come up. So I, I, I've been off and on and off and on. You've and come, here I am. <laughs> you've come off the bench, even though you do you do start <laughs> on, on a lot of shows. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great having you here. Are, are you familiar with uh, with uh, with Sam Lambert, our guest that we have on today? <laughs> Not him personally. I did spend a few minutes looking at uh, looking at his company and the things that they provide. And I got to say, I am fascinated by this idea of big distributed databases. And, you know, there, there's kind of a, a law, a theorem, the cap theorem, they call it. it essentially, it says uh, there are three things that you really want, but you can only ever have two of them at once. And I always find it interesting to ask, <laughs> you know, when we have somebody that's a distributed database, how do you how do you tackle that problem? Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm sort of interested in following up on some of the stuff you brought up on another of our shows uh, this week in Enterprise Tech, which is last summer. So if you're into this, you might want to go back and listen to that one as well. Want to get into it, got off to a, a little bit of a late start today uh, by letting everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by New Relic. If you're a software engineer, you've been here, it's 9 p.m., you're finally unwinding from work. Your phone buzzes with an alert. Something's broken and your mind's already racing. And what could be wrong? Is it the back end or the front end? Is it global? Is it the server? Is it the network? Is it the cloud provider? Do we have a slow running uh, queries? Did I introduce a bug in my last deploy? Now the whole team's scrambling from tool to tool and messaging person after person to find out and fix the issue. According to a new Relic report, only half of all organizations are implementing observability for their networks and systems. The report showed how maintaining network observability continues to be an issue for companies around the world. That won't happen if you get to New Relic. New Relic combines 16 different monitoring products that you'd normally buy separately so engineering teams can see across their entire software stack in one place. You'll get application monitoring, that's APM, unified monitoring for all your apps and microservices, Kubernetes and Pixie, instant Kubernetes observability, with Pixie, distributed tracing, see all your traces without management headaches, so you can find and fix issues fast. Network performance monitoring, stop guessing where performance issues start and ditch data silos for a system-wide correlated view, and so much more. 
More importantly, you can pinpoint issues down to the line of code so you know exactly why the problem happened and can resolve it quickly. That's why the dev and ops teams at DoorDash, GitHub, Epic Games, and more than 14,000 other companies use New Relic to debug and improve their software. Whether you run a cloud-native startup or a Fortune 500 company, it takes just five minutes to set up New Relic in your environment. That next 9 p.m. call is just waiting to happen. Get New Relic before it does, and you can get access to the whole New Relic platform and 100 gigabytes of data free per month forever. No credit card required. Sign up at newrelic.com slash floss. That's N-E-W-R-E-L-I-C dot com slash floss. Newrelic.com slash floss. Okay, so our our guest today is uh, is Sam Lambert um, of Planet Scale. He's an engineer, angel investor, a CEO at the company, building a next generation cloud database. He was VP of engineering at GitHub. He was responsible for creating GitHub Actions, a popular workflow automation tool. Before that, he led the traffic and video infrastructure teams at Facebook. He also sat on the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Technical Oversight Committee and is an active scout at Sequoia Capital, where he invests in early stage startups. And the list goes on. Um, welcome to the show, Sam. It's great to have you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. It's really awesome to be to be back. So, so um, uh, are you new to the title? I, I think I saw a different title for you when you did the This Week in Enterprise Tech last summer. Yeah, I have yeah, I've been, wrong. yes, I've been CEO for about eight months now. And and um, where are you located? Your accent suggests to me a different time zone than we're in. <laughs> so yeah, so originally, <laughs> originally I'm from the UK, but I'm actually based in San Francisco now. I've lived here since about 2015. Yeah, well, uh, originally I'm from New Jersey. I, I was based around San Francisco. Now I'm in Bloomington, Indiana, so... Uh, we we get all over the place, so mm-hmm. um, so so tell us a little bit about Planet Scale and and what makes it different and and we're especially interested in the open source angle of of running a company that depends on open source and is deeply involved in in open source development and the community and how that differs from the kind that isn't. Yeah, I'll start with the open source angle actually. So we are the Planet Scale of the maintainers of Vitesse, which is a open source database orchestration and sharding platform that's built on top of MySQL, another open source platform. We uh, we maintain the project uh, and we it's a project that gets contributions from a number of very large companies that run it at scale. It's the back end for a bunch of large websites and services that we we interact with today. And Planet Scale is the cloud offering on top of the test. So we allow developers and engineering teams to use Vitesse and, and leverage all of Vitesse's power in an incredibly easy to use, simple developer oriented system. You'll see that there's like a bunch of features and kind of our mental model looks very similar to the Git mental model. And that comes from our experience at GitHub and, and our focus on developers. And so it's kind of the pairing of this really powerful commercially available kind of the most powerful commercially available database uh, that is open source uh, as the underpinning for this this developer platform that we have. Hey, Sam, I want to jump in and I, I saw something just announced on your blog over at uh, PlanetScale uh, and that's PlanetScale Insights, which looks really interesting. Um, it also reminds me a lot of, I believe the project is called NetData. Uh, I've been recently fiddling with uh, because of something else I'm working on. Uh, tell us a little bit about Insights, and then I'm curious whether that was actually built on top of NetData. It's not built on top of NetData. It's actually built on top of some of the primitives we have in Vitesse. But yeah, it's um, okay. it's a really exciting uh, new feature. You know, people want to be able to look at what their database is doing, and we all, like, everyone is guilty of writing a bad query now and then, and... and <laughs> Often you find out by taking your website down and insights is the kind of tool that gives people the real time ability to see what's going on. And the reason it's very, very different to traditional kind of database performance monitoring tools is that they usually sit on the outside and kind of look at the database. So they'll do like show process list or they'll try and look at what queries are running, but they can't catch every query. And if you try, um, 
you will cause such an overhead on a system that it becomes self-fulfilling that the system is having issues because of the monitoring. So the really cool thing about insights is when we see the query, when Vitesse gets the query, we immediately uh, send it through a data pipeline to a data warehouse without uh, before it hits the database. And then we can actually monitor the results that come back from the database and it will. we can then look at those results. So we can actually show you every single query that happens against your database as opposed to what usually happens, which is sampling. Most other tools that are like third-party bolt-ons to the database are usually sampling. And that means finding random, errant, problematic queries is very, very difficult. And I've spent weeks of my life hunting certain queries that were causing like <laughs> problems in production. We had a really weird issue at GitHub once. And because you can't log every query, you have to just look at the sample and it's much more difficult. Now we can show you down to literally the exact instantiation of exactly the query that caused you a problem. And that is extremely exciting. It also means that we now have a bank of uh, your query data that we can run analyses on and start to give you better insights. And that's obviously why the product is named how it is. You can also see when you've done a deploy request on planet scale, you can actually see that overlaid against your performance metrics. So say you add an index and it has a really great result on um, query latency, you're actually able to see that directly inside the insights uh, product. Yeah, very cool. Hey, we've got a question coming from the chat room and this is some of the things that I wanted to ask about too. Jojo Dancer is asking, uh, the serverless databases are interesting, but how are they really implemented? Let's let's start with that one. Uh, serverless is kind of a lie, isn't it? There's actually a server somewhere, right? There is servers. <laughs> it is servers. It would be great for margins if there was no servers, but there's definitely servers. Uh, so the way to think about serverless is honestly, it's a movement, and it's kind of a movement when it comes to rejecting how the cloud has has been so far. Right. So it's been very, okay. very complicated, right? To you go and use a cloud tool right now. And yeah, they're not like you're not having to rack servers anymore. You're not having to configure things yourself, but you still have to know way too much about actually configuring the database. And 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 that's not the full promise of the cloud, in my opinion. The full promise of the cloud is taking that that unit of scale, the server, building an abstraction on top of it, and meaning that people can just come to your service to do fundamentally what they're there to do, which is store data and query it. So there's definitely servers, but we really take on the goal of managing it. So you get that, that end goal, you get that end kind of value, which is just exactly how your, your database should behave uh, without having to understand replication zone CPUs. Like, you know, the concept of a vCPU, it, it, you know, you see this in products, you sign up for these databases, you have to select how many you need, you don't know how the database performs. It's too much. It's too much administration. Mm -hmm. It's too much messing around. So we chose to go serverless because we want to build something that has an immense amount of end user value without having to mess around with back end infrastructure. And, and so what? this is something else that Jojo asked about. It, what is the process of kind of plugging an existing app into this? Uh, so if I have something that supports a MySQL backend, can I simply give it, say, a DNS address that points up to either either a Vitess install or to you guys, and it happily runs and works? Yeah, so you can you can actually um, you can actually import a MySQL database into Plant Scale on Vitess very 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 simply. In fact, if it's cloud hosted on, say, Amazon for example or Google Cloud SQL, the the process for migration is actually very very cool and. I have not seen anyone doing this. Usually you have to like dump the data, restore it mm -hmm. into the database, kind of get the database to catch up. That's that's cumbersome right. and very annoying. Um, due to some of the really cool primitives inside the test, we've been able to make that really simple. So the way you do it on plan scale is you give us the credentials of the your current database. And we start to harvest the data in, in the background. So we don't dump the data. We just start to nibble it in. Once we're up to date, then you get the option to redeploy your application with Planet Scale's credentials. So you've st your, your, your main database in Amazon is still running. Your data is uh, live replicating into Planet Scale from that database. And then you redeploy your app <clears throat> to talk to Planet Scale. And we will proxy uh, back through your original database. And then when you decide to do a cutover, we will literally swap the roles. So we will make the old database a replica of plan scale and plan scale will become the, the primary. And so you actually can do a fully online migration into planet scale thanks to the test without having to like 
work plan downtime and, and do all those cumbersome things you usually have to do. Very cool. And, and so I, I assume the the application sees planet scale as just another MySQL server. There, there's no mm-hmm. uh, there, there's no magic that the the application has to hook into or know about, right? Right. There's a few caveats. There's a few things that we don't fully support. Um, but yeah, most, everyone who you know is using MySQL can pretty much come in and start to leverage some of the, the things about the platform, which is great for us. So, you know, MySQL community mm-hmm. is absolutely huge, and there's so many applications out there. Uh, that can benefit from our platform. And so, you know, it's it's really exciting to have that compatibility. So we're talking about MySQL and th- there is kind of this rift in the MySQL community. And I'm curious whether this has impacted you at all. And that is the uh, the, the MySQL MariaDB fork. W- where do you guys sit on that? You know, I think, uh, I think the wonderful thing about open source is that people can go in whatever direction uh, they see fit and MariaDB are doing fantastic work. Um, and so Oracle, honestly, I know people are going to hate me on an open source podcast talking about <laughs> Oracle, but they they do know, but they do know databases. And the MySQL eight release is just uh, is fantastic. Um, and we see patches from Facebook, from Google, from all of these companies that are still contributing to MySQL and making it better and better and better. So open source is alive and well in in either fork. Um, but there was a big concern for a long time that Oracle were going to cause some real damage, and and it doesn't seem to have happened. It seems to keep going, keep getting better. Well, I think the the Maria DB fork is essentially the stick that keeps Oracle in line. <laughs> wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's great. That's the beauty of yeah. open source, right? Like you know, it could go any, it could go anywhere, and and uh, we can build upon those things, and people can create their own services and carry the torch forward. We actually have we run our own fork now internally to power some of the mm-hmm. cool stuff around Insights and some of the the features that are coming over the years. So we are able to own our own destiny there too. Mm-hmm. Uh, are there aspirations for some of those MySQL features eventually getting pushed upstream? Yeah, I think we t- we talk about it. I think if it's something that's very generally usable, I think the right thing to do is to send those back and and contribute to the community alongside a lot, a lot of other folks, mm-hmm. as well as doing it with the test. It's something that we're very tuned to do is contribute to open source. All right. Now there's a, there's a term that has been used in some of the documentation. I think you've mentioned it too. And I, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around exactly what do you mean by sharding when it comes to planet scale? What, what does that refer to? Yeah. So sharding, uh, it's a funny term. Uh, sharding is essentially breaking your de- logical database into many databases across many machines and, uh, segmenting, uh, you can do it by user. You could do it by, product you can do it like there's very many ways you choose a sharding key that essentially allows you to distribute your data into these buckets or shards and it means you can gain huge horizontal scalability so you can just keep adding machines uh horizontally and scale writes and reads uh in a very flexible way um which is obviously something that's quite hard to do at the database layer especially when you've kind of built your application to run on a single host and you run out of space or the the performance of a single uh, machine, you, you've outgrown the performance of a single machine or a set of machines, sharding becomes a solution to actually take it to a very, very large scale. And it's a very common pattern used by large scale database deployments. It's sort of a, uh, to, to, to borrow a C paradigm, it's kind of a uh, hashed key lookup table where you... You have some some method of breaking your data into a replica, a repeatable way to break your data into into different groups, and then you assign a server to each of those different groups. Correct, and it makes your failure domain smaller. If you have a failover within one shard, it's some smaller set of customers that are affected. Uh, it gives you just a bunch of flexibility across your database layer. And so I'm curious how this works with, and I mentioned it in the kind of the start, the cap theorem. That's the idea that you can have consistency, availability, partition tolerance, but pick only two. You can't have all three mm-hmm. at once. Uh, it, yeah. it, it almost sounds like this is a workaround to be able to have all three. It's not quite all three. It's the way of thinking about cap theorem as it applies to the test is you can actually satisfy any of them as long as you understand the, the trade-offs. And, and you kind of sat, you satisfy on a more per request basis. Um, uh, so you can, so consistent, you can be consistent, you can be available. If you partition your data into shards, it, it means that part, partition tolerance is less 
um, problematic because it's just by it's harder to partition the data. Uh, so it can satisfy all. It depends what you need for your application. All right, and, and then I'm curious about kind of the relationship between Planet Scale and and Vitesse. Um, you said you guys are kind of the benevolent dictators of that project. What what does that community look like? It's an awesome community. If you look on our website, you'll see a list of logos of folks that are in our community. We have Slack, Square, um, Roblox, all of these companies that are contributing and working on Vitesse uh, ourselves. We, It's a very, very large project. It's actually one of the oldest Go projects in existence. It started on uh, Go 0.1. If you look at the kind of Go docs, they call Vitesse out as a, they thank Vitesse and the Vitesse team for giving feedback to the language very, very early on. And when it became an open source project and part of the CNCF, it took people just picked it up and uh, ran with it. That's how I got my first kind of uh, exposure to Vitesse was GitHub. We needed to scale our database. Same thing everyone has to do. Uh, we took Vitesse um, and absolutely fell in love with it. And, you know, it'd been a lot. Most companies before then were uh, home rolling kind of their own sharding. And that's mm. really, really painful and difficult to do. And then to have <laughs> Google Tech come out that is has solved this at colossal scale. Vitesse started at YouTube and was YouTube's main database with billions of uh, active users. Uh, it was pretty awesome to get that to come out and, and become a really generally usable open source project. So it's it's seen really great success. And, and so there's there's quite a collection of people that uh, use Vitesse directly and don't go through Planet Scale. What what do you what do you think the kind of the, the breakdown the percentage is of you know people that use Vitesse versus people that use Planet Scale? Well, there's more people who use Vitesse through Planet Scale, although they may not directly know it. If that makes sense, they know they're using Planet Scale. Vitesse is the kind of engine under the hood, and there's a a lot of people using it on on Planet Scale. And then there's obviously our larger customers that are running it. Uh, on-prem themselves. In, in terms of traffic, I'd say there's more traffic going through non-plant scale for tests right now, but that will change over the years. But you guys, you guys offered support contracts, I'm sure, for big companies that still want to do it on-premise. We do work with very large companies, yeah, because we, you know, they they are contributors to the project as well. We we work with them on features and and um, and bugs and 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 generally just making it better in terms of managing the project. You know, when it when it um, when it scales and manages such large uh, projects like JD.com, it's like you see it on screen now, it's just a massive, massive deployment. Um, it works better that we all contribute together and uh, and manage the project well. And it is a very well-managed project. It's one of the very few CNCF graduated projects and has been for a long time. Yeah. All right. Hey, we have a we have one question that is interesting to think about. The uh, again from Jojo Dancer, he's he is one of our uh, um, most prolific commenters, and he wants to know what the uh, command line interface is like. And and this is this is an interesting question because you, this is one of these things that you shouldn't ever have to do with MySQL, and yet you find yourself doing it all the time with MySQL, and that mm -hmm. is pulling up the MySQL command line and and you know manually fiddling something to fix something. How does that work with Vitesse and, and then also with, with planet scale? How do you do a uh, command line interface when you've got things, uh, you know, spread out to the moon like like this works? Well, the great thing about Vitesse is that it, it can transparently shard for the application. So you don't need your application to necessarily know or understand that it's sharded under the hood. So you can actually just connect with a MySQL CLI and it works. Now... There's caveats there that on certain profiles of application with various types of performance, you might need to structure your data differently, but it, it pretty much behaves quite similarly to MySQL and is certainly compatible. Like your client, for example, would be the same MySQL client you would be using with vanilla MySQL. Uh, when it comes to the command line for PlanetScale, it's very easy and flexible to use. Uh, you can create databases, you can create PlanetScale branches, you can do all of these various... Uh, things very, very simply from the command line. And people use the command line to script plant scale into their CI CD process, which is a really um, neat way of doing it. And it's super flexible, super usable. We, you don't have to do any real administration from the command line. There's no me have, messing around having to do that. We handle that for you on the platform. So I, I have a question uh, coming up about, um, about rewind, which I know is something uh, you care about. And, and and uh, and schema migrations, but first, 
I have to let everybody know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. Uh, Collide is a new take on endpoint management that, that asks the question, how can we get end users more involved? This is in contrast to old school device management tools like MDM, which lock down your employees' devices without considering their needs or even attempting to educate them about the security of their laptop. Collide is built by like-minded security practitioners who in the past saw just how much MDM was disrupting their end users, often frustrating them so much that they would throw up their hands and just switch to using their personal laptops without telling anyone. In that scenario, everyone loses. Collide, on the other hand, is different. Instead of locking down a device, Collide takes a user-focused approach that communicates security recommendations to your employees directly on Slack. After Collide is set up, device security turns from a black and white state into a dynamic conversation. This conversation starts with the end users installing the endpoint agent on their own through a guided process that happens right inside their first Slack message. From there, Collide regularly sends employees recommendations when their device is in an insecure state. This can range from simple problems like the screen lock not being set correctly to hard to solve and nuanced issues like asking people to secure two-factor backup codes sitting in their downloads folder properly. And because it's talking directly to employees, Collide is educating them about the company's policies and how to best keep their devices secure using real tangible examples, not theoretical scenarios. Collide, cross-platform endpoint management for Linux, Mac, and Windows devices that puts end users first for teams that Slack. Get endpoint management that puts the user first. Visit collide.com slash floss to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. Visit kolide.com slash floss today. And right now, you get a goodie bag of Collide swag after signing up for a new trial as their way of saying thank you. Okay, so so rewind and, and schema changes and schema migrations. Uh, I know you talked about that in the prior show, and I'm wondering, you know, what is it that rewind does? Yeah, so rewind is just awesome. I like, like rewind is... So I get very, you have to excuse me, I get very excited by our own product just because I spent years <laughs> in, in databases and it was, I have so much of the brain damage that uh, caused by having to admin databases at scale for a long time that now we're, ma- now we're making it simple that, for people. And that's I'm why very, we're the CEO. Yeah, right. Um, and so Rewind is, uh, first of all, it's a world, for, like no one's done this before. We're really, really excited to actually bring this to folks. This is leveraging actually leveraging uh, some methodology we built uh, from GitHub in another open source project we open sourced from GitHub, which was called Ghost, G-H-O-S-T. Uh, we've combined the, the methodology and the, the guys that uh, built that are at Planet Scale. We, we built that into the test and then we the final loop was, was building Rewind. Essentially, Rewind is an undo button for schema migration. Schema migrations are tough as it is. Like, most people have to use open source command line tools to do schema migrations against MySQL and, and Postgres and other tools like that. Um, and it's cumbersome and, and, and difficult and you don't get an undo button. So let's go through a scenario that actually happened to me in my first week at GitHub and took the website offline, which was very unfortunate and very scary. Uh, you, you, say, you think you've cleaned up uh, the models in your code base. You're no longer using certain columns, you want to tidy things up and refactor things. So like we're going to, we're going to get rid of some columns in this scenario. Uh, and you've got a large application. You think you've managed to refactor it. So you go to the database and you go and drop these columns. You, you run whatever CLI command, you, you know, to do it. Uh, and the columns disappear and suddenly your application crashes because it was actually in some background worker process. It was still using uh, those columns, uh, and they now disappeared. The all of the applications queries are failing. Now everything's done. Like this happened all the time. This happens constantly, <laughs> and this this happened in my first week. And then you get this terrible feeling. It's like okay, so we either just like add an empty column, roll forward, and and then like hope for the best. Not not <laughs> not good. Restore from a backup on another machine. Add the column back. Move the data oh. over. We're in an incredibly high stress situation right now, and there's been some very like over the years, extremely public cases of uh, like, you know, dropping data, losing it and it going wrong. But in this world, in the planet scale world, 
once you've deployed your schema change, which you can do like code, we we have a, a primitive that is like the pull request called a deploy request, which means you can collaboratively work on your schema and deploy your, your new schema and it rolls into production online. Once, when you realize you've screwed that up and something has gone wrong, you can literally press the undo button and it will uh, revert the deploy request. It will bring the column you dropped back with the data and the intermediate data that got written to that table will still be there as well. So it is a true uh, rewind and undo for your database schema deployment. And so in the case of GitHub, instead of being down for two hours, we would have hit that button and three seconds later, the site would have bounced back with absolutely no uh, side effects. I just have to say that is beautiful. <laughs> As someone who has crashed exciting. their own services doing similar things, that is a gorgeous idea. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. We're very excited. In fact, in our first week, people were writing in and being like, you just saved me. And I was like, yes, this is, this is exactly what we want. And this kind of builds into the overall plan scale philosophy, which is we have a very good backend database. That's proven. I mean, you've seen the companies that are running it. People are probably chatting, listening to this and chatting in Slack right now. Every message you're sending is hitting the test directly and uh, and working there. We know that. We know we have a great database. But at, at Planet Scale, we, don't, we take that a step further to obsess over what developers do with it, right? No other database platform is thinking about like, what is the life of a developer look like against the database? Why is the database scary? Why are schema changes difficult? Why can't you deploy it like code? We're going there and we're trying to solve all those problems for people too. You must have so many stories. I mean, it um, it, it seems to me you're, 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 you're taking a fairly dry subject and making and really putting it on the ground in a strong way. Um, and, and I'm wondering, I mean, you know, how, how, how how you're constantly reconciling what users are doing, not just developers, um, you know, and your customers, but how does usage get back? I mean, obviously Rewind's a handy thing for sort of intermediaries there, but, um, you know, for ordinary folks that are just trying to keep up, how does that look to them? Or maybe it's so transparent they don't even know. Just sort of like uh, thinking about the end user here. Well, so we try and make it extremely simple for the end user. and We really, really think about what their experience is. And for databases, you've got to be careful. There's a lot of gotchas and things you can run into. And it like databases are almost like a cake mold. Like the constraints that you create, your the applications kind of get baked into that mold. So we we try and be really careful with the constraints we we give to users. And we try not to make it, it has to feel magic, but it ultimately shouldn't be magic, right? People should know where the like, you know, you're on the Tower of Terror ride and whatever. You should at least know where the fire exits are. Um, you want to believe, you want to have fun, but you also, at the same time, it's a database. It has to do the things it's supposed to do. So we, we constantly ride this fine line of beautiful, easy to use, but feels powerful and has heft. So it's almost like Vitesse is a really powerful engine, and now we have to really focus on the interior and the handling and all the other things that make that super usable. So, so I'm wondering, and this is a, a separate thing. Um, uh, recently, there's a at the end of May, there was a news about um, uh, IPv4 and IPv6 uh, over 3.6 million exposed on MySQL servers. Around that, are, are you are you up on that, or do you have anything to say about that one? It's a very common thing that happens with a lot of products and platforms. I think this is actually why the cloud, I mean, we weren't vulnerable to this, but I'm, uh, I think it's, a, it's a, it's actually why the cloud may have some benefits, right? Because uh, when you're running a SaaS product, you have dedicated security teams, you get pen tested. I think often if people are installing things and self-managing, they, they get, they get these foot guns of defaults that are usually defaults are usually there to enable the adoption of the product, but then or the platform or the, the tool, and then the, you run into the foot or the nasty foot cannons that come with with this, and you end up with security vulnerabilities. And I'm sure there's like security researchers out there that have a very terrible picture of the world and what and, and how insecure the internet actually is. <laughs> It was not a vulnerability I, 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 in our code. It was a vulnerability in the example configuration that we shipped mm -hmm. with our code. It's not our fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I think you touched on something there, and, and not only on how the cloud has expanded as as a as a resource, but how SaaS itself has helped open source. Because now you have a layer there that that's actually accountable. I mean, one of the arguments against open source a thousand years ago was I don't have a throat I don't have a throat to choke if something goes wrong, but with SaaS you do. 
Yes. And, is that and a fair assessment, true. do you think? Yeah, it's true. And we also then have corporate sponsorship behind projects that can make them even better. Um, as long as they are good stewards of that and it's a fair exchange of value, then uh, then I think it's fine. Uh, open source has these challenges, right? We learned this at GitHub. There's, it's some, you know, without corporate backing, uh, some open source projects are left to incredible people that maintain critical pieces of the internet, essentially unfunded. And that that's a very fragile place to be. Um, like, I think it's the guy that maintains LibSSO. It's like one or two people. And they 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 do it themselves and get a bit of sponsorship from companies. It's it's a... These people do incredible work and it's, it's thankless work. Being an open source maintainer is incredibly tough. When we take it on as a company, it's people's jobs, right? They take vacation, they vacation, vacation, sorry, braces, um, vacation. They have, uh, they have, uh, coverage, right? They have a healthcare plan with us. They have all these things and we can continue to like contribute to open source and make it better without it, it, it being kind of a burdensome task on the maintainers. I just want to add for the for the listeners and viewers, and you mentioned braces, <laughs> the what you're talking about ones that in your, are in your face, right? Rather than than, than some software yes. thing. For the, yeah, <laughs> right? I had braces on Monday, so I'm still getting used you're, to these. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. That's tough. Yeah. For all of us, you're, go ahead, you're, you're Jonathan, a brave, sorry. you're a brave man to do the interview that, that soon afterwards. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was very excited to be, very excited to be here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I kind of want to dig into that a little bit more because, you know, that's, that is quite the, uh, it's quite the challenge around open source because you have things like, uh, NTPD, which everything uses. And it's, it's literally one guy who would like to have more money for it. Uh, then you have obscure things that everything uses, like the list of time zones around the world or the, the list of the way computer terminals work. And I'm forgetting the, you know, the, the technical name for that. But there's this really obscure database that describes all of the different ways a terminal can be set up. And if something breaks in that, your command line breaks altogether. Yep. And there's... There's not, we, let me put it this way, as open source, we've not necessarily figured out how do we fund these things? How do we make sure that, you know, the next generation of developers is going to work on some of these obscure but important projects? And I don't know, I'm curious, what do, what do you think the, the answer is there? You, you've, you've, obviously, you've put something together that works well for Vitesse. Do we just need a, a company for every one of these projects or... You know, there's there's some other things that people are are trying to make work, like Tide Lift and uh, other projects like that. I'm curious your thoughts. I think people, I think co corporations need to be responsible and go back and fund the projects that they rely on, both for their own con like business continuity, because they'll find out eventually, right? If if a if a project gets maintained, <laughs> I mean, the the risk is there, right? And and it and it's mm -hmm. and it's still not simple. I mean, like during the GitHub acquisition, we spent a bunch of time going through and auditing all of our open source use because there's risk, you know, there's risk to using certain open source and there's licensing problems. Sure. Licensing is a really hot topic when it comes to open source and security and compliance. And so I mm -hmm. think one way to make this as sustainable is, you know, if you're a developer at an organization and you're using a great open source tool, nag your bosses to give you some money to sponsor the projects that you use and help them become sustainable and allow people to build sustainable lives uh, around maintaining open source. And then I think we could, it could go a very, very long way. And companies and corporations mm -hmm. are starting to, to look at doing this. Um, but then there's always got to be some other angle, right? Like you don't, we, uh, it's a generational thing, right? People now appreciate open source more than they ever have. And mm -hmm. I think companies are starting to donate and, and, and sponsor and fund open source for the good of open source and 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 organizations like the CNCF good and the Linux Foundation do great work uh, helping move this along and defending open source. But there's some companies that expect something in return, right? They expect a fundamental change to the project yeah. if they're the ones paying for it, or they want this thing that only they will use that requires all this work. And so it's it's still in its infancy in terms of how corporations relate, but it's getting there. And then we had the open core business model, which it works for some people, doesn't work for everyone. I think this new generation of SaaS and open source frameworks that work best on the SaaS that produces them, that kind of thing could be really good for sustainability. Mm -hmm. Sure. 
Uh, speaking about that, bringing it back, I, I there, there's something I like to ask uh, projects. I, I don't know if you'll have an answer for it, but if you do, I, I anticipate it'll be really interesting. And that is, what is the weirdest or most novel use you've seen someone make, either of planet scale or Vitesse? What's what's the strangest thing someone mm. has, has done with it? I'm not sure really because it's a back it's a database right so it's kind of hard to use it in <laughs> in weird I'm some I'm sure someone's up to something strange and if you are I would love to if you're listening and you are I would love to, I would love to hear it uh, but I'm I'm sure there is some very crazy use for it but uh, I'm not aware of many um we used to get people I, using GitHub in extremely crazy ways that was well, yeah. stories there <laughs> Yeah, that's for sure. I, I'm sure there is somewhere, uh, you know, a, a video hosting company where they break their videos down into chunks and store them as yeah. discrete entries into the database. Uh, someone has built a Turing complete inside the database uh, y- using MySQL. I'm sure there's all kinds of stuff, oh, yeah. but unfortunately, some of those things you never hear about. Uh, there's there's an M dot. There's an XKCD comic that says that uh, you know someone has solved the p equals np hard problem. But it's tied up in a egg beater uh, initialization routine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, all right, uh, Doc, you want to you want to take it and uh, get into uh, Actually, CCF the, and some of those? Yeah, I was just I, I saw I see here in uh, that you're on the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the CNCF Technical Oversight Committee. When when I back when I, I was an editor with Linux Journal and and I visited. Uh, um, and talk with people working on the CNCF. Um, it was very focused on 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 the cellular system and and 5G, especially rolling out 5G and the side of 5G that wanted to get databases as close to um, as close to where they're where they're used as possible with low latency. Is that still there? I mean, what is the CNCF about at this point? And and does that matter either? Because I remember. One of the things that I heard, and it may, it may just be a rumor, not even a rumor, just something uh, of, of interest, was that the the phone companies wanted to get into 5G beca- for the database, b- database business. They wanted to be as close to the customer as possible with the least latency as possible. In other words, just to provide the facilities there inside of which um, SaaS companies could come in and then pay them for rent or whatever in their former central offices or whatever. So I'm wondering if you could shed some light on that because I've never had anybody write, really talk about it. We're never going to f- make the speed of light quicker. <laughs> so, you know, we can't, if, you're, if your database is in Seattle but your users are in Japan, I mean, there's, there's, there's some latency there that's going to go across the ocean. Um to, to serve that query. So having your data nearer the user is always beneficial. This is obviously why we have people use CDNs and, and, but it gets really difficult in the database world when it comes to consistency, because to achieve cross node consistency, databases need to talk to each other. And then if they're going across uh, various environments, uh, it can become really, really slow. That's why we have planet scale portals, which means you can put replicas of your data simply and easily anywhere in the world. So you can query those, to uh, get the latest up-to-date information in a read-only fashion nearer the user and and improve the speed and latency of your application. Now, some people take that very far and make it kind of the fundamental primitive of their database, and that has, again, its own caveats and gotchas that become very, very difficult. I think it's an interesting conversation that's going on about this. There's also just a lot of applications that don't need to do it. uh, it, It's building globally. Uh, this way is is kind of the new microservices. It's the new like hot thing. It's like let's have this completely geo distributed application, and then you find that like ninety percent of people's users are in continental US or or in Europe, and it's a pointless endeavor. And you've gained you've taken on a load of trade offs that you just didn't need to take on. So it's very complicated. You need to think about it for your application, for your traffic patterns, or for your user base. But the or the other thing is that most of the major websites on the internet run out of very, very few locations and don't go for this fully like, globally replicated thing. So um, this may or may not be involved, but I think you probably have some insights on it. Um, I just spent the last month and a half being all over the place. I was in in San Francisco and up in Marin and, and in Los Angeles and then places in North Carolina, uh, towns in North Carolina that are busy going through a transition from an older industrial model to a new one. Um, 
and I see commercial space for rent everywhere. And I have a, I have a, um, uh, a son who works in recruiting and staffing and all that. And we have a generation that doesn't want to go into work. They want to work, but they don't want jobs inside buildings. They don't want to be in cubicles. Mm -hmm. They want to be in their own spaces. And this, it, it, what it seems to be underneath all of this, where I'm going with this is that you take digital technology and plus the internet, plus the low latency we we're just talking about, and you have an entirely new um, framework for work of all kinds. Now, I mean, your work with GitHub's involved with this and, and a bunch of other things. I'm wondering if, especially everything involves a database, of course, now at this point. So you must have some insights on where this goes over the next few years, because I think we're going to see fewer and fewer people in these big buildings and more and more residences maybe putting into those, into those buildings, whatever else. Retailing is the same thing. No more giant department stores. Those are turning yeah. into something else. It's very interesting from a company cultural kind of point of companies yeah. going remote. It's interesting technologically as well because it's a systems problem. We One of the reasons we built plant scale branches and have them solely in the cloud is because we want people to have easy uh, development environments that don't require uh, like their local machine being made to look like um, production, which is an impossible an impossible task, especially in this SaaS-based, cloud-based future. And that means that people can do development from anywhere and we allow branches to be provisioned wherever you are, so local to you, so you don't feel that latency. Culturally, I think it's very interesting. Remote work is very interesting. GitHub was a very early company to go fully remote. Uh, well, I say fully remote. There We had an office, but the company acted remote. It was more like a co-working space for the company. Uh and it's an awesome future. Plant scale is extremely remote. Um, uh, we don't really have a central office anymore. Uh, we're a majority of us work from home, and it's it's something that's really really amazing. And it's definitely going to be demanded by this new generation. They want to travel while they work. They want to live a different lifestyle, and it's it's really amazing. And it's amazing that technology can 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 power and enable that. Hey, I want to I want to jump back in. I saw something on your bio that really fascinated me, and that is you you do also some work at Sequoia Capital, which sounds like um, maybe one of the better venture capital funds. Uh, one of the things that we talk about here on on Floss Weekly sometimes is uh, some of these open source projects and the changes that they go through, and sometimes the weird things that they do as a part of trying to get venture capital funding. I, I'm curious your thoughts on how VC changes floss and maybe the way that startups can do that better. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I, uh, and I haven't been so active recently, but I was doing scouting for Sequoia, which is like found finding interesting early stage companies uh, mm -hmm. to in, invest in and uh, something, you know, that is I'm passionate about. Yeah. I think venture capital has a really large role to play in making open source sustainable. There's this is a great exchange of, you know, we can fund you um and event vcs can fund you to uh not think about necessarily the business model just yet but to build and then develop an open source uh, develop a business model on top of that and it means that open source has a sustainable and healthy uh pattern to be developed and so I, you see so many open source projects that are still going that are, that are doing really really well gain open source funding and it means it just build, builds makes it much more healthy without someone have to build a profitable business from day one on top of open source is it's, it's, you know, open source, any project, it's really, really tough to do. Yeah. We, we seem to get, we seem to get some guests that come in and, you know, they have like an open core model or, or some, you know, strange licensing thing. And we kind of always think to ourselves, is that something that their venture capital guys made them do? And so I'm just, uh, I don't know. It's, it's just kind of this odd, sometimes an odd relationship between VC and an open source project. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's I, weird sometimes. I'm not sure the VCs make many people do anything. I think it's, I think the, the VCs, VCs have to invest in, if you have to, you have to pitch VCs on what you think will turn into a sustainable business, right? Like you can't, especially in this current environment, it can't be an experiment. You have to know. Open core was interesting. Um, to me, well, I think now most companies founding are probably trying to think about how to have their open source project maintained um, by you being a SaaS company. 
Uh, that's certainly how we want to do it. Open core has a lot of challenges. It needs a, like you end up building a massive support model to support companies on prem. It's harder to grow the business. You can't. You, it's harder to model how your revenue is going to go. It's. Uh, but some companies have made it work fantastically. I just think you know it's not a model that's going to persist forever. I think it's more about can you build a SaaS service on top of the open source project that you have built and in databases that's obviously a very natural thing to do in in some in some sense yeah. for other projects it's a much much harder thing to do yeah so i'm i'm curious uh let's say somebody's involved in a project maybe the main developer for a project doesn't have a business model yet but you know they're they're starting to see the writing on the wall of it not working as a hobby project anymore but maybe it's something that's important enough they would like to keep it alive and and so kind of is there any advice that you would give somebody in in that state where they're saying, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how this could be a business, but I'm not seeing it immediately? Like where where should someone go to, to start uh, start thinking more about that process? Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's, there's many things you can do. You can reach out to venture capitalists and say, look, I have this idea. This is what the adoption looks like. Is there a business in this? Uh, is one one thing to think about. The other is if if there isn't a business in it or you don't have the heart to go and do a, a decade long journey of building a company, you could reach out to your biggest users, right? You could reach out to companies that depend on it and say, look, you know, I'd like a job. I want to keep working on this project. You benefit from it. Is that some kind of clear, is that a good exchange of value here uh, in terms of, of doing that? And at GitHub, we used to hire the maintainers of projects that we depended on and we, we didn't necessarily require much from them other than keep the project healthy because we need it. Um, we did that with Rails and Shopify does that with Rails and we did it with Git and there's so many, you know, companies that do the same thing. That's one way of doing it. Uh, or maybe it just becomes a side project where you get a bit of sponsorship to do it. But there's that that kind of value that you can get stuck in, which is it's somewhat successful. That it's a demand on your time, but there's no commercial way of getting, way of making it commercial. That's a really tough spot to be in. Yes. Yeah, you it is. You probably get sworn at on GitHub a lot if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Hard Absolutely. life being a maintainer. Seriously, people maintain it. You know, it is sometimes. They're saints. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so there's one other thing in your bio that really fascinated me, and that is that you worked at Facebook doing some of their video integration stuff. And I have to say, 95% of the time, video on Facebook and live video is just awesome. And 5% uh, of the time, they're terrible sync issues, and it's horrible. <laughs> I'm curious. I'm curious if you have any uh, tales from the trenches or maybe an open source angle on on how Facebook did most of the time so well with video. <laughs> so I had a short stint at Facebook, but the time I was there was absolutely fantastic. And they just have incredible engineers, absolutely incredible people that go so deep into certain subjects, uh, which is the great thing about being a, an organization with like 40,000 engineers and, and, and at mm -hmm. such massive scale, it's, it's beneficial to have someone who sits there working on network card drivers and making them uh, a little bit better because it can save you an, uh, a massive amount of money. And it's, it's, it's tiny, uh, tiny improvements in performance can make things much better. Facebook processes a lot of video. I, I believe the most in the world by volume uh, in terms of small videos. Uh, lots of people going live, people going constantly. And it was a, there was so much work that goes into it at Facebook, including having um, uh, devices that sit within the, the networks of um, carriers, building those, making sure they work autonomously and securely. Um, it's a really, really hard problem. And they, they did a lot of work on it, uh, working with Quick, doing... Uh, a lot of optimization, running their own video stack inside the applications. It just was constant work from incredibly smart and diligent people that that worked really, really hard on it. And you're right, it is very fast. There's lots of intelligence, even in deciding what CDN or data center your application, your, your app or you get routed to. Uh, it's just huge amounts of engineering that goes into it, and they're they're phenomenal at it. Yeah, I was I, I, one of the things I've often thought about or, or noticed, especially early on with Facebook, is that well, Twitter gave you the fail whale over and over and over again, <laughs> and and other services like the uh, like Flickr, which I depend on a lot doing photography, they have some you know a little image of a girl hauling a panda around, saying there's something wrong, it's our panda, you know, and but Facebook, I think Facebook has had one kind of like big public failure, but. And it was temporary, but for the most part, has been remarkably um, well run engineering wise. And I guess that's oh, yeah. what you're saying in a way. And it's not just a matter of having more engineers. I think it's a matter of having better ones 
or better engineering. Yep. So hats yeah, off on that. It's taken so seriously. Some of the people that, you know, I would really love to grow up to be like the, the engineering leadership at Facebook. They are just outstanding. They they just truly take being a, a massive, large scale operation really sensibly. And they also built pragmatism into uh, their culture very, very, very early on. It was like, we're PHP and MySQL to start. And they took that very, very far. They, on, they are opposed to some engineering cultures. Facebook is very much about let's ship things quickly, see if it's good, deliver value to users, and we'll make it work when we make it work versus um, other companies that just spend forever kind of just like perfectly architecting everything, never get it into the hands of humans, and then it doesn't work. So there is a set of very pragmatic, very intelligent folks working super hard to make that happen. And it's glad that it's noticed. I mean, the, the reliability is very, very good. Things do go wrong. I mean, it's a huge operation, but it's... Um, that, I think it's the pragmatic approach and, and doing sensible approaches to engineering took, took them very, very far. Well, this has been a, a very fast hour and um, uh, we always close it with a, with a few uh, questions that, are, uh, that begin with, are there, is there anything we haven't asked you yet that you'd like us to have asked um, <laughs> or that your team has wanted you to ask? Uh, no, I think so. I think it's pretty comprehensive. It was, we went through a lot. Yeah, yeah, we have. So, so let's, well, one we've actually dropped from the list just because it's getting to be old hat in a way, but we haven't brought it up here is, do you have anything to say about blockchain? <laughs> you know, actually, I was at a dinner with a bunch of CEOs a few months ago, and there was this really, one of the people at the table, where obviously crypto came up, um, and one of the people said, why don't we not, let's not say crypto, let's not say blockchain, let's just say like extremely consistent, very slow database and talk about it that way and i thought it was a really really interesting way of framing it because that, that's it's that's a technology right like that's a there's a and then what use cases do we have for that technology we struggled <laughs> we were like it's like when you just frame it it's like here's the specs we really struggled to find a usage for that because like most data applications want faster a little less consistent right um and so i think it's very crypto to me is fascinating it 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 catches this loop in my brain that I have, which is, I know I'm getting old now. I know there's a whole new generation of developers that are building and there's energy and there's something inside them. And, and you know, you don't want to become irrelevant. You don't want your company to become relevant. You want to build things for the next generation. So I still can't abandon it. I can't say no because there's clearly something there. There's also a lot of scams and pump and dump and whatever um, <laughs> going on. So it's very hard to, to extract what's real and what's good there. But I still keep trying because I don't want to like dismiss a new technology that could, could be transformational. So it's, I'm between two worlds right now. So our, 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 our last two questions are, what are your favorite um, uh, text editor and scripting language? So I, yeah. when I script, I would pref I, like either Ruby or Bash, um, and text editor I use VS Code because it's just become so good now. In fact, I use Code Spaces as well, which I I really love, and they pair very nicely with Plant Scale branches. But I just love writing a you know a nice Bash script now and then can take you very far. I also have to program in Python a fair bit for like Home Assistant automation and stuff like that. Well, fantastic. Well, it has been great having you on the show, Sam. This is a uh... Uh, Thank you for having me. It's a, a, a quit fave. You've been on on uh, on uh, on <laughs> Twit twice so far, and I'm sure you'll be back because this is not a <laughs> this is not a, a concluded science or subject. It's uh, it's interesting to me how far you've gone since uh, the last time you were on, which was less than a year ago. So thanks yeah, so much for being me. here. It's been great. Thank you for having me. Happy I love the Twit network. Um, it's awesome <laughs> to be here. So, so, uh, so Jonathan, <laughs> how was that for you, man? I, I love when somebody that's working uh, both on an open source project and a company, uh, when they're excited about what they do and, and when they see the, the possibilities of the technology that they're working on, right? And so this, this idea of it's so easy, especially when you're doing something like a schema change, it's so easy to be the intern that trips over the, the, the figurative power cable and brings everything down. And, and then he said, well, let's just do something about that. Let's fix that. Let's make it so that, you know, there isn't another intern that trips over that particular power cable. And I, I love that. And the fact that he's so excited about it. And 
it, somebody somebody talked about the idea of ratcheting uh, when it comes to technology, and it's like you, you should you should learn from the things that have gone wrong in the past and actually fix them so that they're not going to continue to haunt you. And uh, so, just that idea about being able to rewind and not do a backup restore, but a schema restore, so that you instantly fix the thing that you broke. I, I just think that's great. Um, and then you know, it sounds like they're they are working really hard to have the right kind of relationship. Uh, with their community and with Vitess. And it, just the fact that, you know, the majority of this cool stuff that we talked about, if you really want to, you can host it yourself. And you don't, you don't have to pay them anything to do it. Um, but maybe you want to because it's a hard problem to solve doing it on yourself. Um, I, I just think it, it sounds like they've got the right mindset to be involved with an open source project and, and doing uh, open source as a service, as it were. Yeah, I, I I love and especially going back and uh, and listening and watching his uh, last appearance on uh, on on Twit. It was really interesting not only to see the delta between the two, uh, but to sense how deeply involved in the world that he and Planet Scale are. Um, and it, you know, a, a huge part of it is just being deeply involved in how open source gets made and what's the best way to deploy this. What's the best way to, way to use it? How does SaaS work here? How do you work with the cloud? How do you spread that out as close to the customer as possible? How do you help them recover, rewind when things go wrong, as you were saying? Um, and knowing what's going on in the world, I think that I think that matters. I mean, I I know from my early days with Linux. I mean, it, it, especially some of the kernel kernel developers is like we only we're never in user space. We're only in kernel space, and we're <laughs> and there's this huge um, contextual gap between the people who made the stuff that everybody runs and and the people using the stuff on on really particular applications right and and it's a huge difference and um and I actually think it's one reason why linux on the laptop or the desktop took so long to happen um and that's not a knock it's just kind of a mm -hmm. an assumption because i i think if something like linux it really it really is under everything but part of what's going on in the world today is Everything runs in databases. Databases are everything; <laughs> they really are. And um, and that's you know, it seems to me that there's probably nobody with uh, his or her fingers in in more pies where things get done than these guys. So it's a uh, hats off. Yeah. The 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 other the other angle to this that is uh, a juxtaposition of being incredibly novel and boring is that it's all based on MySQL. And so he, he mentioned the way Facebook will take something like PHP and just push it and push it and push it to where it's it's based on the same idea, but it's just been pushed all the way out to the limit. And if you're familiar with some of the crazy things Facebook has done to make PHP work better, uh, they're doing the same thing with, with MySQL, which was you know, never designed to be, to be used globally. It, it's, it's one of the old databases. It's the, the simplest one, you know, your, your, your lamp stack that everybody kind of turns their nose up now that, yeah, you know, Linux, yeah. Apache, MySQL, PHP. Well, here's one of those, you know, one of the old players, one of the boring things that you, none of the cool kids use anymore being pushed out to the extremes by, by these guys. And uh, I, I just, I find that fascinating that it, to, to take, to take the boring and kind of make it revolutionary again. It, it's fun. And, and how it's uh, maybe keeping, as you were pointing out during the show, um, keeping Oracle straight and the, the oracles of the world as well. You know, it's not just that one company, it's everybody using this stuff. That's yeah. Well, the, I mean, the threats, me the threat of forking, the threat of if you mess this up badly enough, we're just going to take our toys and go play in the other room with our fork. Uh, that does. That's that's a very <laughs> powerful motivator for Oracle, particularly to to straighten up and <laughs> to treat them right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so what do you have to plug before I get into the hour plug? Okay. Uh, so the two things I've got, uh, first off, hackaday.com. And of course, I run the security column over there every Friday morning. I cover a lot of really interesting stuff. Make sure to keep an eye out there. I've got some other things in the pipeline. Uh, I may or may not have my Starlink mounted inside of a tire on the top of my minivan. Uh, we might see some <laughs> things about that over on Hackaday here pretty soon. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, is uh, on Club Twit. Make sure and check out the Untitled Linux Show. Uh, we go live every Saturday afternoon. And uh, then there's the Club Twit exclusive feed that everyone should be subscribed to. 
Yes, indeed. I, um, I, I, I want to plug that one because uh, joining Club Twitch is a great way to support uh, our network. Uh, it, a, a member gets access to ad-free versions of all the shows on Twit, as well as other benefits as a bonus Twit Plus feed that includes footage and discussions that don't make the final show edit, and bonus shows like the Giz Fizz, Ask, uh, Ask Me Anything, as Fireside Chats with some of your favorite Twit guests and co-hosts. There's a community aspect to it. We have a fun Discord server that's available only for Club Twit members. Uh, you want to know <laughs> when when Jonathan's uh, Untitled Linux show goes live? There it is. Um, join the Discord. Catch it there. Have questions about a career in tech or IT? Uh, join that Discord. Uh, I'm sure you have plenty of advice and valuable information from passionate Club Twit members. Uh, so sign up. Join Club Twit for just $7 a month. Head over to, let's see, twit.tv slash club twit. That's twit dot tv slash club twit join today and we thank you for your support and we thank you for being on the show we'll have another good one next week and until then i'm doc searles this is floss weekly we'll see you then the world is changing rapidly so rapidly in fact that it's hard to keep up that's why micah Sargent and i jason howell talk with the people making and breaking the tech news on tech news weekly every thursday they know these stories better than anyone so why not get them to talk about it in their own words subscribe to tech news weekly and you won't miss a beat every thursday at twit.tv